Okay. So can we start? Okay, so let's, let's start. Let me just briefly introduce uh, the speaker. So Istvan, thank, thank you very much for coming. And thank you. Uh, for being a guest in the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. So uh, maybe you can say just one or two words about uh, the, uh, your university, and then um, our speaker, Isvan Harmati, will talk about coordination of multi-agent uh, robotic systems. I think this is a topic that will be increasingly important in the future because all the diff difficult tasks that we have, all the let's say, technological and societal achievements of our times are the, there is, there is a feedback in the system. Uh, all the achievements are the result of uh, cooperation, coordination of multi-agent systems, be it multiple human beings, be it multiple computers, be it multiple robots. So we're very much looking forward to your talk. The floor is yours, Isvan. Thanks again for coming. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. So my talk is really related to the topic today, which was uh, uh, given today, the title of the coordination of multi-agent robotic systems. I am Istvan Harmati, as Rolf said, uh, from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. So first of all, I just... Uh, briefly tell you some words about the multi-agent systems and after this uh, I will rather focus on the control architecture of such systems and after this I would like to introduce very briefly uh, some strategies and tactics which can be used for this kind of agents to achieve a global task. Okay, so and finally I uh, give you a little conclusions. So the first question is that, what is the multi-agent system? Uh, actually, there are many, many definitions. Uh, they are quite similar to each other. Uh, one of them is from the Wikipedia, which says that multi-agent system is a system composed of multiple interacting intelligent agents. Multi-agent systems can be used to solve problems uh, which are difficult or impossible uh, for an individual. And actually, this is the reason we are using this kind of systems, because we can solve more complicated problems uh, which, for which we don't have chance if we use only individual agents. Uh, Multi-agent systems are actually related to many disciplines, uh, such as uh, economics, uh, social sciences, uh, computer network, telecommunications, uh, programming, but uh, our first interest and main interest is somewhere between control theory, robotics, and artificial intelligence. So the problems and the topics I would like to talk uh, about today is somewhere here. Okay? So uh, if you are uh, asking that where we can meet multi-agent systems, actually there are many, many applications, and especially in your research. Uh, for example, many, many uh, car companies uh, uh, developing uh, intelligent systems uh, for cars where we can organize the intelligent cars into a convoy on a highway. So, for example, here you can see a, a test system of the Volvo company uh, where a, a cars, cars can follow a, a leader vehicle which is a track in this case. And for example, if this track is uh, going from, uh, from Budapest to Zurich on a highway, then the drivers actually don't have to drive. They can read, they can uh, uh, working on their computers, and they can uh, make any fun. Uh, but the intelligence system arranged everything to, to drive actually the system to the right uh, city. So uh, another uh, application is the so-called automated guided vehicles, where you can find them in factories, hospitals, warehouses, where many many mobile robots uh, should move the objects from a 
initial place to a desired final place, and they have to carry out this task without any collisions, and they have to actually optimize the time uh, when they uh, complete the task. <coughs> so uh, it's very important to organize their motion. Also, another uh, interesting application is uh, the robotic assembly, where in a wheat uh, factories uh, you can you can find that many many manipulators, robotic manipulators, working together to move heavy objects and working uh, in different places on this object and different types of works. Okay, so. Uh, uh, coordination for this kind of uh, task is also uh, very important. Also, uh, today you heard about the swarm intelligence and swarm formations. So, uh, if you have many, many tiny robots like a swarm, uh, they can do or they can complete a very complicated task together, uh, especially uh, in, a, in such places which are dangerous. Uh, no, there is no place for humans, and uh, that's why uh, this kind of robots can be very useful. For example, if there is a disaster and after a, a rescue operation, then we can use uh, this kind of robots to discover the area, and also we can use this kind of uh, uh, mini quadruped robots uh, for surveillance. So, uh, also, uh, there are military applications as well, such as uh, push-it evasion scenarios, where some multi-agent systems have to defend an area, and this kind of vehicles, which can be aircrafts, for example, should be operated together in order to, to carry out this task, uh, task successfully. So, but you may not think, but even in the agri agricultural, uh, you can use a multi-agent system in a very effective way. Uh, in this case, uh, we, have a, we have a harvest machines and they have to work together in order to paint an area in an optimal uh, manner. Okay, so in this way, it's also uh, important application, and of course, you probably heard about uh, robotic games such as uh, robotic robot soccer in the Robocup uh, games. So this is also a, a very important application, and also have much fun. We have much fun for that. So our focus is to co to make cooperative control of mobile robots in order to accomplish a common task. For this, actually, uh, many, many things are required, such as sensor systems, camera image processing, uh, actuators, such as motors, uh, communications are very, communication is very important as well, which can be centralized and decentralized. And, of course, control architecture is uh, highlighted uh, in, our, in my topic as well. And also, monitoring and supervisory control uh, should be used for a successful uh, uh, mission. So, we are focusing on the control architecture and the control of the multi-agent system for the optimal cooperation. Uh, in order to, to make an optimal cooperation actually a very, very difficult problem. If you would like to solve this problem in a mathematical manner and to prove that this is the optimal motion of the robot, then actually in many, many tasks it's impossible. So that's why we try to uh, find not an optimal solution but a suboptimal solution which is quite close to the optimal one but can be solved. Uh, in this case, we can decompose uh, the team, the control uh, architecture in a way Then we introduce a strategic level, a tactical level, and a low-level control. So when the robots and the agents are moving in the environment, then we can have a measured uh, 
signals. Based on this measured signals, we can get information about the environments. This kind of information uh, <coughs> sorry, is available for the team, and this team will develop a con an actuation signal for the robots, which is basically how to move the legs, how to move the wheels of the robot, which makes the robot, which makes possible the robot to move. So uh, this kind of change chain is composed by the strategic level, tactical level, and the low level control, as I said. On, stra on strategic level, uh, we have to solve the optimal locations of the robot. So we have to decide where to where to send the robot and what to do in globally in order to to accomplish this task in an optimal manner. Uh, this, does, this task decomposition is actually uh, designates a goal for every individual robot as well. On the tactical level, uh, the individual task for the robot should be carried out uh, in the best possible way as, as we can do. And in many, many cases, this kind of uh, tactical level is actually related to path planning and collision avoidance in dynamic environment. For this, you can use uh, optimal path planning, uh, soft computing, artificial intelligence methods, and game theory. Such as also for the strategic level, usually we use a game theory, artificial intelligence methods, such as like uh, swarm intelligence, we heard about uh, this today, and also heuristics. Heuristics are very important, but unfortunately it works only in special cases. So, in the low level control, we have to control the robot. For this, we have to know the physics of the robot, how how it moves, what are the differential equations uh, uh, where we can uh, uh, modify the, the uh, path of the robot. For this we use uh, control algorithms. So today uh, I focus on strategic level and tactical level and I would like to, to introduce or just to introduce uh, some popular approaches only in a couple of words. We don't have time, unfortunately, to, to go into details, but maybe you can get the idea which is behind these algorithms. So, uh, which is about the strategy, I would like to uh, talk about the value rules, the heuristic-based methods, and the uh, game theory. So, value rules are was a very uh, successful algorithm in robotic soccer, and this algorithm was developed originally, as far as I know, the University of Amsterdam. Uh, their team was named by Triller, and you can see details on this on these links. Uh, it means that roles are distributed among the teammates. So we can define those uh, attackers, defenders, and goalies in the robotic soccer. And e each robot has a potential for a role. Let's say for an attacker, uh, here you can see uh, the potential which is which, for which we can use the estimated time which is needed to an agent to catch the ball. Okay. Also, if we have a defender, then also we can compute the uh, the potential for every robot for this role, which, which depends actually uh, on the distance between the agent and the ball and the distance between the agent and the opponent goal. Okay? Based on them, we can make an order for every role which robot has a high, highest potential. Uh, the robot which has the highest potential for, for a role, these roles can be a uh, uh, can have a, a all ordering priority, so we start with the uh, most important role. So in this case, we see that which robot has the highest uh, highest potential for the, for this role, and this robot will be selected for the most important one. After this, we can consider the second important role. For this, we also uh, 
compare the potential functions for every robot which has which does not have any uh, role yet. So in this case, we also can select the best uh, robot for this role and so on. So finally, uh, for each role, we can find uh, we can find a robot, an agent. Only those agents are cooperating to each other, uh, which are having this in, having in the same value rule. So for example, we can have values for the passers, the defenders, and also some uh, inactive players. Here you can see two rules for the passers, uh, which says that if you want to, if a robot wa wants to pass the ball uh, for another uh, agent, then act actually they have to harmonize their decisions. So uh, the passer should keep the ball in that direction where the receiver uh, will move to. So in this case, if these actions are harmonized, then these two robots can get a reward function uh, for this kind of combination of actions. Uh, however, if their actions are different from this way, then of course they won't get any rewards. Well, Actually, we have many, many value rules, and we, in the value rules, uh, there are many, many uh, different roles and different uh, robots as well. So finally, we can get, we can build up a coordination graphs where all the robots are involved uh, in some extent to other robots in the actions, and if we add the local uh, rewards together, then the sum of local payoffs in the value rules will define a global payoff for each combination of the agents, uh, agents' tactical action. So the optimization problem we have to solve is given. Uh, this kind of problem is easier to be solved than that of, of the game theory because game theory should consider all the combination of actions. Here we just have to harmonize the actions which are, uh, in, which, which are in the coordination graph and which are related in the coordination graph. So, sorry. another <coughs> popular method is the heuristic based method. <coughs> uh, for example, we can use it for robot soccer as well. I just would like to introduce it because uh, we had a similar uh, problem uh, previously. So instead of thinking about the good position of the player, actually we can think uh, of the good position and the good path of the ball. So we are focusing on the ball. For this, we can define the quality fields for the ball, such as uh, the shooting area. Here you can see that if uh, the uh, value of this function is higher, then it means that it's more, desire, more desirable the ball to be there, at least in, in the viewpoint of, of our team. Also, uh, we can have another potential field for the uh, shoot, shot clearing, which means that uh, we can measure where can we, where can we uh, shot the ball in order to, to avoid the opponent's, te opponent's teammates. And also we can have a plus clear areas where we can uh, uh, put the balls and in this case, uh, this kind of position of the ball is uh, quite good for us. So, uh, adding together uh, these this maps, we can create uh, aggregated maps, and uh, in this case, we can obtain the best places for the balls. So, actually, we have to uh, compare all the values on this map, and we have to uh, pick up the highest highest value, but maybe not only the highest value, uh, but also uh, many, many highest values, which can be seen on these slides as well, hopefully. 
Okay? Uh, so in this case, we can decide where to move our robots where we want to uh, defeat the opponents. So uh, for this selection, we can use, for example, uh, clustering algorithms such as subtractive clustering. And a third popular method can be the game theoretic approach. Uh, in robotic soccer, for example, it's uh, basically a game theoretic problem. In this case, uh, we have a world where the robots are moving, the balls are moving, and so on. And based on the sensor information, we can have, a, we can have a, the numerical values of the positions of the robots and the, and the ball. And based on them, we can create, we can build up a game model. In the game model, we can consider all the combination of the tactical actions of, the, of our teammates and the opponents, uh, and, the, and the actions of the teammates of the opponents. Based on them, uh, we can then uh, compute uh, different kinds of uh, equilibrium points, such as the minimax uh, strategy, the mesh equilibrium points, and the Zuckerberg equilibrium. Maybe we have uh, many, many such kind of equilibria. Based, uh, based on them, we can select the best one, if it's possible. Uh, for this, we can use a selection criteria, and the decision is made by the arbiter. If uh, we decided which equilibrium points is, uh, should be implemented, then this uh, the commands will be given to the robot according to this kind of, uh, of strategy. So let's see what kind of uh, team, uh, uh, what kind of games uh, can be occurred uh, in this situation. If we consider the uh, game which is between team and team, then it's basically a two-person zero-sum game. Uh, in, at least in the robotic soccer, and the solution in this case is security strategy, which is a worst case scenario, which means that all the team which consider uh, the decision of the other team, uh, which makes the worst situation for them. So, uh, the solution, if, the security, if we have some luck with the security strategy, then actually this is an equilibrium point, which is called the set the point. Here uh, you can see a very, uh, very easy example where uh, we have two players, player 1 denoted by P1 and player 2 denoted by P2. And all the elements in the matrix are actually the cost for player 1 and at the same time the profit of player 2. It means that player 1 wants to minimize the cost minimize the number from the matrix, and player two wants to maximize it. So uh, when we have a, a, a decision making, then P player one can choose the rows in the matrix, and player two can choose the column from the matrix. The question is that what rows and what columns should be uh, selected by the players? So we, you can consider that if we think that we are player one, then player one should first consider the first row and uh, consider the worst case scenario, which means that the highest element in the first row is four, in the second row it's three, and in the third row it's two. Uh, it, player one should compare these elements and has to choose the element which is the minimal one. In this case, this is two in the third row. So it means that the security strategy for player one is the third row, and the security level is actually two. It means that there is no case that this player has a worse uh, cost uh, if, if he plays this kind of strategy. Similarly, if we, consider, uh, if we consider the second player, then we right now have to see the first column, the minimal element, the first column, which is zero, 
the minimum element of the second column, which is minus one, and the minimum element of third column, which is minus one, and, base, and amongst them we have to select the highest one, which is zero, so it means that the security strategy for player two is the first column, which leads to a security level uh, equals to zero. Actually, if these two security levels are the same, then we have an equilibrium uh, point, which is called set the point, but this is not the situation in this game, uh, which was a uh, demonstration. So, uh, equilibrium points means that if player uh, one choose this uh, strategy and player two uh, use this strategy as well, then uh, their decisions are the optimal response to the decision of the other player. So, uh, what about uh, the situation if we consider only one teammate? One team. In this case, uh, there are teammates in the team, and usually when a robotic soccer team, for example, want to reach a goal, then the teammates should cooperate somehow. For this, uh, we need a communication and centralized uh, control. However, in many, many situations, we just don't have uh, enough communication, and also the agents are intelligent agents. It's a little bit uh, uh, the opposite case in the swarm intelligence, where they are uh, quite primitive, but still they can uh, decide their action individually. So here also, robots can decide uh, their action individually, and uh, they try to figure out their optimal uh, <coughs> solution. So in many, many cases, the cooperative game is actually transformed to non-cooperative games. It means that uh, for, for this, uh, we have to uh, apply the Nash equilibrium point. Here you can see an uh, example uh, of a B-matrix game. Actually, this is a very... Uh, uh, demonstrative and popular, which is the prisoner dilemma. No, actually it's not, I'm sorry, I uh, just uh, missed it. So in this case, uh, you can see that first matrix is the cost matrix of player one, and the second matrix is the cost matrix of player two. Both of the players are gonna minimize their cost and like before, uh, player one choose the rows from both of the matrices and player two choose the columns from both of the matrices. So in this case, uh, Nash equilibrium, equilibrium point means that uh, at this solution or at this point, none of the agents, none of the robots uh, should uh, change his mind because his cost uh, won't be less than than the Nash equilibrium cost. You can see that, for example, minus two and minus one in the first row and the first column is actually a Nash equilibrium point, which is uh, uh, highlighted by le uh, light green, if you can see. So, for example, if uh, player one just change, changes his mind and instead of first row, he decides to choose a uh, second row, then you can see that uh, his cost, instead of minus two, will be minus one, which is higher, so it's not a good option for that. Uh, but in this case, we can assume that the second player keeps its original de decision. Also, if the second player would choose uh, the second column instead of the first column, you can see that instead of minus one, his cost would be one which is higher than the Nash equilibrium cost. Similar situation can be observed for uh, the second row and the second column, which is also a Nash equilibrium point. And actually, this is one of the main difficulty in the game theory concept. Then what's hap what happens if there is more than one Nash equilibrium point, but there is no communication between the teammates? So which one should be selected? Maybe one of the Nash equilibrium points, one of the Nash equilibrium points are 
uh, more favorable for the first player and the other is better for the second player. So they cannot agree on the solution even if they can communicate. So, uh, in this case, a possible uh, solution can be uh, the so-called Stackelberg equilibrium point where you can define a hierarchy in the game. So it means that uh, we will have leaders and followers. Uh, I would like to uh, demonstrate also this kind of strategy in this very simple matrix game. Also, the first matrix on the left-hand side is the cost matrix of player two, and the matrix on the uh, right-hand side is the cost matrix of the second player. Like before, the first player like, chose the rules and... Uh, how, yes. how, much longer, how much longer do you think uh, it, it will take you? I think we should probably sort of soon come to a, a close. How much longer do you think it will take you to... We will also need some time for a discussion, of course. We should have some time for discussion at the end. Uh, okay, so uh, five minutes. Well, I, will, I will finish it soon. That's perfect. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So the solution, uh, the question is, which one should be, uh, which, which is the best solution for the players? So uh, in this case, uh, the first player should consider all the possible optimal response for the second player and choose the one which is better uh, for him. Uh, this kind of solution is not the same as the Nash equilibrium points, but it can be shown that Stackelberg equilibrium is uh, much favorable for the for this, uh, leader than the Nash equilibrium points. So, uh, which relates to their tactics, uh, there are many, many approaches as well, uh, which can be uh, which can be lead to uh, motion planning algorithms. Uh, for this, usually we can uh, define a stage additive cost function and all the robots can use the principle of optimality for backward recursion, for example, and we can find the optimal solution for that. So, uh, based on that, for example, we can solve a problem such as on this uh, slide. For this, if somebody is more interested, I can uh, recommend a, a book from Stephen Laval, which is about motion planning algorithms. So here you can see that uh, the red robot wants to go to, to the red area, and also the blue robot wants to go to the blue area. And uh, originally, uh, their paths uh, are colliding, but using this uh, motion planning algorithms uh, with the stage additive cost function. One of the robots can go into this uh, shelter and avoid the, the obstacle and the collision, okay? So the same situation is here, uh, where, where the red robots want to move to, to, the, to this place and the blue robot wants to move to this place and if both of the high priority for both robots are the same, then you can see here the, the, the path. However, if the red robot has the highest priority, then he can choose the, the shortest path, even though uh, the second robot should wait for the red robot. Okay, so uh, finally, I just wanted to tell you that optimal coordination and control of multi-agent uh, system is usually very difficult, so that's why we use a suboptimal, suboptimal solution and artificial intelligence methods heuristics. So many, many comparative uh, uh, approach and ideas are exist. So I just encourage everybody just to look around in, in the literature. Okay. So uh, thank you for your attention and sorry if uh, I exceeded my time frame. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for a very stimulating talk about collective intelligence and how you can apply or what some of the principles are that can be used to coordinate multi-agent robot systems. And we have seen specifically the case also of uh, robot soccer. Now, I would like to open the floor for, we have still have a couple of minutes, so I would like to open the floor to the global uh, lecture hall for questions or comments. 
So, do we have questions or comments to uh, Istvan in Budapest? Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, uh, did you make a program based on these principles, and what was the result of it? Can you hear me? Okay. Hear you. Uh, so we can hear you very well. <laughs> okay, I heard the questions. Uh, so usually, uh, game theory uh, is you'd be, would be the perfect solution. However, uh, at this technical level, we have this is a very very complex problem, especially if you want to solve them in a continuous domain. So, for example, if a robot can choose decisions in a uh, from infinitely many options, then you cannot just you just cannot solve it, especially if you have many many robots. Okay, so that's why we have to discretize the problem and use artificial intelligence methods, maybe the value rule methods. So somehow we have to simplify the problem uh, to get a, a simulation and a real application uh, in the real life. This kind of motion planning algorithms can be uh, uh, solved uh, you know, in a good way, which means that uh, for this uh, or technical level it's okay for that, but for this we also make some trick in, in the, in the cross-function definition. I don't know if it's... Uh, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I also have a question. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, um, it may be a speculative kind of question, but uh, the point is, uh, how, at which level you see embodiment and self-organization, uh, let's say, in a more advanced formulation uh, of, of what you have presented? No? Because this is kind of okay. classical AI uh, applied to collective motion. No? Uh, if you try to, fit, to speculate, how you could uh, leverage uh, on uh, embodiment concepts which are typical of this uh, lecture thread uh, or self-organization uh, in, in this context? Oh, I see. So uh, in this context, uh, mainly in a strategy level, you can use this kind of uh, self-organization algorithms. So if you think uh, about, for example, uh, for the value rules methods, it's also a kind of uh, self-organization because uh, the ag agents and the robots, which are close to each other, they will cooperate to each other. So uh, if they are close to, then you have the better chance to, to move together. So if you consider globally the whole team, then Later, sooner or later, it will be a self-organized team. So something like that. And the embodiment? Well, uh, maybe also in a strategic level as uh, well. Uh, uh, you have to uh, figure out these things. I, I, I didn't want to uh, Details in this kind of direction, but uh, I think on strategic level you can also uh, use this kind of uh, concept. I don't. Think yes, because I've been thinking yeah. about this for a long time, so. I... Well, it's a, well, uh, yeah, it's a, it can be a good idea to, to use that, but. Uh, all right. I haven't fo focused on that. Okay, thanks very much right, for the you. question, Fabio. Yeah, very much, very much to the point, I think. Uh, do we have other questions or comments from the global lecture hall? Someone, I mean, there's also an issue, I mean, to maybe to follow up on the, the question from Moscow is of course you can find these you know optimal algorithms you know from game theory and then you can say well this would basically be the optimal thing to do now in, if you think about embodied systems relating also to fabio's question from madrid then uh, there is also the point even if you know this would be the best move to do there is still the sensory the challenging sensory motor task of actually getting the ball 
you know, in the soccer case, getting the ball to the right place. So knowing what the optimal thing to do is and being able to achieve that goal is a completely different issue or is it at least as challenging an issue um, as the one of determining the optimal move. And then the question is whether there are, whether you should take constraints from the sensory motor abilities of the individual agents into the optimization process. Yeah, well, of course, we have to consider the limitation of the agents as well. And uh, <clears throat> mainly this kind, of, this kind of issues and problems are appeared on the tactical level. Okay, uh, the tactical level will carry out uh, the tasks such as the passing the ball to, to move the ball or to reach the ball and so on. So a uh, strategy has to know something about what are the capabilities for the tactics. Okay, so this kind of limitation should be considered. So. Okay. I think we have time for another question from the global lecture hall. Anyone? All right. Well, if this is not the case, then uh, I would like to thank again our speaker, you know, for inspiring us and also the, the, I would like to thank the people who uh, participated in the discussion. I think, you know, there are some um, issues that have been answered, partially answered, but there are some open issues that are uh, generated by this kind of approach. And I think it will be interesting to see how these ideas will evolve in the future. So we're also very much looking forward to your research results uh, in the future and to what extent then they will contribute to the improvement of, let's say, robot uh, soccer.